In 2006, I had been a practicing military physician for approximately nine years, and that's when I met patient Jay. He'd be someone who changed the way I thought about medicine for the rest of my practice. Patient Jay had been a forward air controller in Vietnam, which means he called out fire control missions behind enemy lines for incoming aircraft. When we met, however, he had the unfortunate diagnosis of stage four pancreatic cancer with intractable pain, which worsened his PTSD. So I set him up for a trial of intrathecal fentanyl. He did really well, had a reduction of his symptoms, and went on to placement with a pump. He resumed some components of normal living, interacting with his family and his beloved granddaughters. Six months later, however, his son stopped by and told me that his dad had passed peacefully. But in 2006, patient J and this technology changed my life. So let's talk about intrathecal targeted drug delivery. I'm Dr. Askew, and these are my stories. Hello, hello, hello. I'm just looking for my slides now. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about just briefly this morning, a little bit of history on intrathecal targeted drug delivery or intrathecal pain pump. Types of pain I'm typically seeing, uh, a, a brief glimpse at some data, compare and contrast the pump technology that exists currently, what does a typical placement look like for me in the operating room, and uh, a friend shared some of his findings with me concerning uh, uh, several pancreatic patients he had followed. So you can see in 1885, we see the, one of the first uh, descriptions of intrathecal anesthetic. In 1901, uh, intraspinal morphine was reported. But we move all the way up to 79 before we see intraspinal morphine for cancer pain. Then 82 and 91, Medtronix reported and then released to the market their intrathecal uh, pain pump. 2006, I placed my first pump, which was a, a Medtronic, and in 2012, a second pump, which is now being marketed by Flowonix, was introduced. And this is the real issue. In the United States, we see that predominantly uh, we are using the world's uh, hydrocodone. I'm not saying that we have more pain than the rest of the world, um, but we certainly use more of the uh, oral opioids. And in that group, though, you see three out of four people uh, do report some type of misuse or using of other people's medication. That subsequently led us to the death rates that we're seeing now. And you can see back in 2002, 10, 12,000 uh, deaths. And, and at that point, still, motor vehicle accidents uh, really represent the majority of deaths in the United States. Now we see in 2017 um, that we're expected to see, or that, we're, that we did see greater than 70,000 deaths related to opioid overdose. So typically the types of pain I'm seeing, you can see here, this is a patient with pancreatic malignancy and pancreatic ductal dilatation. This patient had renal cell carcinoma and subsequent pain following uh, treatment and ablation. And then just a lot of the run of the mill chronic spinal issues, everything from multiple fractures to post laminectomy syndrome. So looking at data, we see that there's a high prevalence of, of, of cancer uh, pain uh, greater than a million patients. As you trickle down to the bottom, you see that uh, those people who will meet criteria greater than three months life expectancy, we're seeing on average greater than 160, probably now approaching 200,000 patients per year with less than 1% of them having adequate pain control as they report it. The majority of that being uh, significantly pancreatic uh, cancer pain, solid organ pain, <clears throat> excuse me, and a bone metastasis, which, which is quite painful. You also see in 2015 that the NCCN guidelines did include intrathecal route of opioid administration, and it's become a valuable tool. So when we look at some of the data presented by uh, late Lisa Stearns and Dr. Statz, we see that when patients were evaluated in two, two typical groups, chronic, uh, excuse me, um, typical medical management, and then targeted drug delivery. We see in pain reduction, reduced toxicity, and in survival that there were improvements uh, associated with uh, intrathecal targeted drug delivery. 
You also see significant re reduction in uh, resource utilization as a person uh, approaches uh, end of life. So the pump technologies that exist. Medtronic uses the peristaltic continuous pump, which has a roller, which delivers medication into the intrathecal space, uh, whereas the flowonic pump has an, a chamber which has internal pressure, and there are two gates that open, a gate that fills and then a, a gate that's timed based on known um, concentration of medication and duration of gate opening, that, that results in uh, delivery of medication. But what that also results in is a greater distribution. We'll talk about that briefly. So you see in a typical 24-hour period, the electronic pump delivers that medication continuously, but the, the uh, flowonics pump typically delivers 50 microboluses per day, spaced every 30 minutes. And what some of that has demonstrated is that there's a lower significant adverse event reporting, uh, typically that being granuloma. Um, also that we see a reduced escalation of medication in people who have bolus delivery. So a typical placement, positioning is, is really important. I will have them in a decubitus position uh, after gaining access, and that's kind of the most important thing. We won't, we won't even open the pump until we've gained access. And, and sometimes that has been difficult to the point where I had to leave the OR and either evaluate imaging or repeat imaging to find a, an appropriate uh, access. Subsequently, I've marked uh, the patient's abdomen prior to the procedure so, so that I can anticipate skin movement. Obviously, as you place patient in a decubitus position, there is some skin movement. Next, I'll tunnel the catheter. Uh, the pump is connected and tested to, to make sure that we truly are still in the intrathecal space. And subsequently, that pump is a place within the anterior pocket, irrigated uh, copiously. I'll make sure that I do a sturdy deep layer, uh, interrupt it, and then I do a running um, subcuticular layer as well. Then also you see basically at that point, I can clearly see where the pump is under the skin, but I'll also perform ultrasound just to evaluate um, that the, the pump is actually sitting appropriately in his pocket. I've actually had some patients who come in at first evaluation and the pump has flipped. Um, the other thing is after fill, I'll check the pocket just to make sure there's been no inadvertent pump pocket fill. Now, just a little bit of data, a, a, a colleague of mine shared the case of 18 patients who had pancreatic cancer and had subsequent intrathecal pump placement. You see in stage four uh, uh, pancreatic malignancy, there's about an average two and a half month survival. Visceral pain is probably the most common issue uh, encountered from a pain perspective. Um, many of these patients suffer significantly um, and they're taking really high doses of IV and oral medications. And, and what they find themselves is typically more sedated than they want to be, especially at that kind of terminal point in their life. So looking at 18 patients, preponderance of them being female, about 61 years old, you can kind of see the race breakdown. Um, and what he found at the end uh, was about a 12 and a half month survival in those 18 patients versus the two and a half typically reported Obviously, this is we need more perspective in randomized controlled data, but it's it's hard to kind of create that those cohorts when you can tell when a patient has any uh, knowledge that they may uh, have better outcome with the pump. And so, just as a business builder, I'm in a private practice now, and a lot of these patients, even though this is very satisfying to me, a lot of these patients then present to me as an interventional radiologist for other issues of pain, other issues of vascular disease and my diabetics. And so this becomes a significant component of business building. Uh, but one of the biggest problems is making those relationships with uh, local uh, oncologists. Uh, but, but what I find is significant quality of life improvement and better pain control. So this has really been really kind of a brief survey of, of the intrathecal pain pump. 
certainly, uh, hopefully Glenn will have my data, my information. So if there are any questions from the audience later, um, or even once this COVID madness clears, I've actually had page, uh, physicians down to follow me, uh, see what the pump practice looks like. Um, you, you can gain a significantly better insight uh, following that. And go Pfizer. Do we have any questions from the audience? Dr. Askew, can you see the chat box? Uh, let me see. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Chat box. I think no, I did not. Questions in there, Doctor Askew. I don't see a chat box. Uh, it would be at the bottom of your uh, kind of where you're. But it, it doesn't look like there's any. Oh, here, someone said, "Do you do microdosing for your pumps?" Uh, yes, I do. Specifically with with some of the. Um, I, I have a slight bias now, and I just got to put that forward because I like the the bolus distribution versus the peristaltic peristaltic distribution, because what it's shown is you have a greater distribution in the intrathecal space. And so typically, you know, I've had patients who presented on greater than 500, 600 uh, uh, morphine equivalent dose, and then they leave on anywhere from 50 to 100 micrograms of fentanyl per day. When you divide it over a 24 hour period, you, you basically see that that, that, that is, uh, a, a very small, a very small dosing. Do you titrate their medication down prior to placement? Uh, I try to most of the time, but you know, like this week I got a, a patient with stage four pancreatic malignancy and he was in significant pain. And in and that, and a patient like that, I'm going to titrate their medication down while simultaneously uh, up titrating their pump. And, you know, obviously when you have uh, quality of life and duration of life issues, I'm going to be more aggressive. But a lot of the, uh, a lot of the patients who may have issues related to uh, like post laminectomy syndrome, I'm going to try to get them down uh, before placing the pump. What is the dose of hydrocodone you are using? I'm, I'm not using hydrocodone. I'm typically using uh, fentanyl. And, and you really have to think about medications based on distribution. Uh, morphine tends to be more uh, hydrophilic, so it has a typically greater distribution. And uh, fentanyl uh, tends to be more uh, hydrophobic, and so it tends to localize more. So depending on how I want spread, and also um, uh, morphine has been associated with some urinary retention in, in uh, older men. And so... Those are things that I'm, I'm considering when, I, when I'm filling the pump. All right, and this is the last question we have for you. Can you, there might be two, can you comment on dealing with infection in patients on IT therapy for extended periods? Well, I've been, I guess, extremely blessed because in the pro, you know, it, I've been doing this since 2006 and I've had one quasi-infection um, where I end up removing the pump, the, the, the gentleman had had, I think six or eight other spinal procedures to include multiple cages. And so I removed the pump from him, but I've not seen any other pumps and I don't do any of the pump pockets or, you know, vancomycin in the pocket. I don't do any of that. I just use, I really concentrate on technique and I uh, irrigate aggressively. Last question, are pumps for terminal pain indicated more for difficulty with route, uh, i.e. swallowing pills or side effects like over sedation or inadequate pain relief? Well, if you remember, it was even though I, I sped by it pretty briefly, one of the things that we saw in intrathecal pain pump placement was uh, reduced toxicity, meaning overdose in older patients who go and take too much medication. Um, that was significant quality uh, of pain control was also significant. So I'm in terms of difficulty swallowing, I've, I've never used it for that more. So people have better quality of pain control with reduced 
toxicities, and that does include constipation. You have an 80-year-old grandma, she doesn't want to be constipated, and she doesn't want to deal with that mental clouding sometimes associated with opioid use. And so I, I'm able to address both these issues as well.